Good morning. My name is Lena Ferizzi. I am the Student Services Specialist Senior in the Student Leadership Center. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you today to uh, Glendale Community College's Native, Hi Native American Heritage Month celebration. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce to today's speaker, um, Miss Patty Talahongva. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering it again on that. Um, Ms. Uh, Talahongva is Hopi. She comes, to, she comes from the villages of Walpi and uh, Sitsomofi uh, on First Mesa in northern Arizona. Her clan is Corn. Uh, she is an award-winning journalist. Her work can be seen in museums, including the Heard Museum in Phoenix and the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, she also produced and directed a documentary on Native American or American Indian code talkers in World War II for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. She's currently writing a book on her family's experience at the Phoenix Indian School, which she also um, attended. It will be published by Legacy Lit, um, an imprint of... Um, Hachette Book Group in, two, uh, in 2025. Uh, she's also working on an investigative documentary for the PBS program Frontline. Miss Talahongva will be discussing her lived experience with the American uh, boarding school system in Phoenix. Uh, please join me in welcome Patty Talahongva um, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. And, and welcome and good morning to everyone. Sanga uma angka kya no kutsaku kyang mana yan hopi matsiwa no pari tawahong vayan pahan matsiwa no tsitsumovit angka no kao wangwa pupiupaki wangwa. Good morning again, and uh, just letting you know a little bit, uh, introducing myself and my language. My Hopi name is uh, White Spider. That's kutsaku kyang mana, and I come from the villages of Sitsumovi and Walpi, as Lena mentioned. And I'm also Corn Clan, Ka'o We're also known as Water Clan, Badki Wangwa. So I think I always like to use a little bit of my language in my presentations because, again, as you'll hear from the boarding school story, this was one of the things the government tried to stamp out. This was uh, a very concerted effort by our federal government to Americanize us, you know, to civilize us, to assimilate us, and um, as Henry Pratt said, kill the Indian in him and save the man. But um, I say that because our ancestors, those young children, were filled with their integrity, and they stayed true to who they were, and so they just continued to speak their languages when no one was looking, or away from people who would punish them. So they were smart, and they knew to hold on to their identity. So we honor them today by speaking as much as we can. And um, I encourage anyone who's still in the process of learning their language to ask your family, somebody there, who can teach you how to say a prayer in your language. So you can start from that, you know, going, going beyond introducing yourself. So when I think about going to boarding school, I, I have to laugh because who knew how much boarding school would impact my life? And, um, and I'll explain that to you as I go through my presentation. Because when you're in the moment, you just know you're a teenager being sent away. And part of that is exciting, right? You're going away, and then the homesickness hits, and then you feel isolated. And so you go through all these emotions of what it's like to be away from home. And it's not your choice. Because in 1978, my tribe did not have a junior high or a high school on the reservation, so we had, I mean, if you wanted to continue your education, you had to go away to boarding school. And there were a number of them um, to choose from. And in my generation, we were able to choose. We weren't being ordered by government agents to go to one particular school. So again, what is this history of boarding school? What is the federal policy that put this in place? So I'm speaking specifically about Phoenix Indian. Now, um, <clears throat> Phoenix Indian was started in 1891, and by then, Carlisle Indian School had already been established and was operating. And Henry Pratt was the man who, again, came up with the idea of boarding schools. So he was an army officer, and his whole life was military. So that's how he based these schools. That was the model he used to, to run the schools. 
which meant in those early years, the late 1800s at the turn of the century, my own grandmother, who went to Phoenix, India, and, uh, probably around 1920, at that point, they were still wearing military uniforms and they were still marching around. They had to march from their dorms to the dining hall, back to their dorms, back to class. And in the early years, especially, the uh, other idea with boarding school was to have these kids learn um, uh, a trade. So the boys were taught very specific trades to help build the towns and cities, and the girls were taught domestic science. So they could use their domestic science to work in other people's homes. How do you think they worked? What kind of work did they get assigned as a domestic science? Cleaning, right? Basically being a maid, a housekeeper, a child care, you know, providing that service. And again, it wasn't meant to go back to the reservations and do these jobs. It was meant to build the towns and cities. So you have this history of boarding school. Um, how many of you have all been to Steel Indian School Park in Phoenix? Okay, about half of you. I encourage the rest of you to go and take a look around that park. I tell people when we go back there, we don't see a park. As alumni from Phoenix Indian, we don't see a park. We don't even see a school. What do we see? We see home. Because this is where we lived. You know, we didn't get to go home on weekends. Most of us didn't. We were there 24-7 for the entire school year. And, um, and some people didn't even get to go home during their Christmas break for various reasons. So we lived there. And, um, you know, when you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the same people over and over again, they do become your family. Whether that's a functional or dysfunctional family, that's another debate. <laughs> but you do become a family. So today, it's Steel Indian School Park, and it's located on the corner of Indian School Road and Central. It's a beautiful park, and it's, people think it's quite large. But understand that when it was created, it was, the site was picked because it was three miles outside from downtown Phoenix. So far enough away from the proper white community but not too far away where they couldn't get there if they needed to. And they quickly found reasons of why they wanted to be there. So when, when people would come from uh, Phoenix and they would get to the school, they automatically just started calling that Indian School Road. And that's how the street was named. So um, today, oh, by the way, the school grounds went from basically that Indian School Road in Central all the way east to 16th Street. And then the northern boundary was the canal. So if you go there, you look around, or even take a look at an aerial map, you can see how large the campus was. The heart of the school was always right there at the, at the corner of Indian School Road and Central. The rest of the land from 7th Street on to 16th Street was all farmland. And so the kids were taught how to raise their own food. They had cows, they had um, pigs, they had turkeys and ducks and chickens. They raised you know, a garden, vegetable garden. And so they actually provided for a lot of their own food. And they had surplus, which was sold back to Phoenix. Were the kids paid for this labor? No. In the dorms, um, how many of you have family who's served in the military? OK, so not officers, because this doesn't apply to officers. But when you're an enlisted person in the military, one of the first things you get assigned is detail. Do you know what detail is? It's your chore. It's a chore that you have to do. Like, all kids grow up with chores, right? Empty the trash, do the dishes, you know, mop the floor, sweep the floor, whatever. But because Pratt was an Army officer, he didn't call them chores. He called it detail. When I went to school at Phoenix Indian, that term was still around. So we had to check the, the bulletin board when the detail list came out and we got our assigned detail for that month. So again, the aspect of military life was still there when I was going to Phoenix Indian. Um, making our beds was a big deal. Making them nice, you know, with those cut corners that the military requires that most hotels take now, right? <laughs> You walk into a hotel room and those sheets are tucked so tight you can't even get in there. Um, 
those were aspects of military life that continued to exist until Phoenix Indian closed. So today, as you walk around the park, you're going to see three buildings that are still standing. And this is one of them, Memorial Hall, and uh, right next to it, to the west, is uh, we used to be the old elementary school, and, um, and then when the school closed and the city turned it into a park, that building sat vacant until 2013. And then as life comes full circle, I ended up taking a job to lead the renovation effort of that building. And today it's open, we opened it in 2017, and it's the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center. And you can all call them up and get a tour inside there. They have space you can rent. Um, it's a wonderful uh, facility there. And they have a gallery. We created a gallery to tell the story of Phoenix Indian. So there are photos there, there are uh, the guided tour, and just a really wonderful space. So I highly recommend that you, you get out there. And every second Saturday of October, they have an open house. So you can go out there and, um, and enjoy and, and see. So uh, just to the west of that is the dining hall. And that building was, uh, took two years to construct, and it was completed in 1902. And it is older than the state of Arizona. Because when did Arizona become a state? 12, exactly. And uh, Valentine's Day, right? So it's older than the state of Arizona. So all three of these buildings are on the National Register of Historic Places. So you see the history that Phoenix Indian lends to the city of Phoenix and also to the state of Arizona. And yet our history is not taught in our schools. And so most people grow up and go to school in Arizona and they're not taught this history. They don't know that this was a boarding school meant to assimilate us young native kids. And that effort continued throughout the school's life in different ways. So Memorial Hall was put up in 1922 and there is this plaque, let me go backwards. You see the white pillar in the front of the building? This is the bronze plaque that's on that pillar. So when World War I broke out, the boys from the Indian schools across the country enlisted. And they went not to fight for a government, not to fight for a flag, not to fight for the Constitution. They went literally to protect their homeland. And moving from boarding school in those days, you know, 1910, 1912, you know, World War I time frame, it was easy for them because they already knew how to wear uniforms and march around and do detail. And so military life was very easy for them. And while well, I, I say that, not talking about the combat side of it, but just adjusting to a military lifestyle. And um, so several boys from Phoenix Indian served in World War I. And this plaque has everyone's name on it, including the two boys who were killed in action uh, during World War I. And so when you walk by there, take a moment to look at that plaque and read these names because they're boys from many different tribes across the country. And again, students from all across the country were enlisting in the military. Now, remember, at that time in World War I, American Indians were not US citizens. We didn't get citizenship until 1924. And it was a direct result of them enlisting in, the, in World War I that Congress finally said, well, I guess we should make them citizens because they served with distinction in the war. Um, that didn't mean they got the right to vote. We did not get the right to vote in Arizona for decades after World War I. So this building is in honor of those boys who served in World War I. When you go inside the visitor center, you're going to see this display, and this is Ira Hayes. Now, the photo is a little, a little bit small there, but you all know the story about the flag raising at Iwo Jima, right? And did you know that one of the boy, one of the uh, young men who helped raise that flag was Ira Hayes? And Ira is from the Pima, the Gila River Pima Indian community. And he was a really great student at Phoenix Indian. And he enlisted in World War II, he became a Marine paratrooper, and then he found himself in this position where he was asked to help carry the flag up Mount Suribachi, and then he helped raise that flag. So he, um, you know, I, I ask, this is one of the trivia questions I'll ask a non-native audience, you know, name the Native American who helped raise the flag at Iwo Jima. And nobody knows, but you see the picture. Now, which one is he? He's the one in the very back, the very 
It's a small photo, but you guys can look. Um, he's the one in the very back of the group, and he's kind of like you can see him pushing motion. But what you can really see is that he's got his shirt or something tucked into his back, uh, like the back of his pants, and it's hanging down. So you can see that's uh, Ira Hayes there. And um, the book is called Flags of Our Fathers, and it's a great book. So if you have it, and there's a movie if you want to watch the movie instead, but um, there's a really great book that gives you a bigger picture of who Ira Hayes was. But, uh, you know, so we have outstanding people who've been to Phoenix, India, and went through the school system and made, you know, a distinguishing uh, part in, in American history. Um, again, cheap labor. Girls were taught how to cook and clean and take care of other people's kids. The boys were taught trades, which could you know, be farming, uh, working on big farm equipment, which actually evolved into auto mechanics, and um, uh, carpentry, brick lane, painting, and printing, which is interesting. So this is the whole history of what the boarding school, uh, how, it, how it came about and how it evolved. And I tell people when you're asking, I hope you guys ask me questions at the end, or even just raise your hand now and I'm happy to answer questions. But um, uh, in this evolution, I think it's important to remember when you're asking a question, what decade are you asking about? Because what happened in 1890 is very different than what happened in 1950 or so. And I say everyone who went to boarding school has their own story. I went there, I have my story. But I can tell you, my classmates, had very different experiences. And some kids I know hated being there. And they didn't get involved with clubs, you know, athletics, nothing. They did the bare minimum and they went back to their room or back to the dorm and they did not engage because they disliked it so much. They had their reasons. I've talked with el uh, other women, elders, who said the only reason they liked going to Phoenix Indian is because they had their own bed, they had their own space. Because back home, there were multiple generations living in one house, and they didn't have that private space. So at boarding school, they had their own bed. You know, they had their own dresser, you know, so they could have their things, and, um, and nobody bothered them. Or if you did, you got in trouble. So they liked the aspect of space, personal space. But they didn't like speaking English. And so these two women I'm thinking about, they're White Mountain Apache, and now that they're elders and they're living back on the reservation, they refuse to speak English. They only spoke to me because I don't speak Apache. <laughs> so they said, we, we hardly ever use English. It's all Apache, because they came from a time where the language was still being stifled. You got in trouble for speaking your language. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, all those military service, okay, the government said, you can't speak your language. It's English only. Boy, that sounds familiar, right? But then, in World War I, the Choctaws used their language to create a code and to send military messages. And that code was never broken. In World War II, there were about 20 tribes who used their language to create codes to send military messages. None of those codes were ever broken. And how is it that the government who said English only ended up going back to those same kids and asking, can you use your language to create a code to save our country? So very complicated history, you know, with the federal government. So <clears throat> you have all of this going on in the background. This is my grandmother, my great-grandmother, excuse me. Her name was Al Yamka, and um, she was uh, able to escape being uh, uh, sent off to boarding school. And I can't tell you more than that because it's in my book I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> so this is the tease. But um, this woman was amazing. And her story of survival and courage and integrity is something that I hope to honor when, you know, by writing this book. And I'm writing this book not just for this current generation in our family, but future generations. You know, uh, If I ever have grandchildren, no pressure on my son. <laughs> if I, you know, if my sisters, you know, their kids have kids. So they're my grandchildren as well. But when they grow up in future generations, I want them to know 
This is your ancestor, and this is her Hopi name. Later in life, she was given the name Lucy. And her husband only ever went by one name um, that uh, non-Hopis gave him. His Hopi name was Sahuputaka. And since they couldn't pronounce that, they said, your name's going to be Lalo, <laughs> which in Spanish, I guess it's Lalo. Um, Hopis called it Lalo. English name. So um, by the time my great grandmother got married and started having children, her kids were taken away to three different boarding schools in three different states. What does that do to a family when you're broken apart? I mean, can you imagine coming back home when you're, you know, 19 years old and a, another person walks in the door and that's your sister? Here's your brother, and you have no bond with that person. How would you react? What would happen? When we talk about generational trauma, that's a part of the story that we're talking about, but we don't name it like that. The government broke up our families, not just by taking the kids away from their parents, but by taking them away from each other. And there, we have still not been able to figure out any rhyme or reason on how the government decided to take those kids away and send them to different boarding schools, other than just the fact that that was a part of the assimilation effort. Why raise all the kids in one boarding school? Break them up, send them to different places, they lose that connection, and hopefully they lose the connection to their people, and they don't go back home, they stay in the cities, because the other underlying effort by with boarding schools was to take the land back. If we get enough Indians off the reservation, then we can take the land back, because no one will be living there. So these underlying efforts of the boarding school policy and how it's affecting us even today. So that's my so so that's how we say grandmother at First Mesa. Um, trades again, and these are young men who were taught the uh, uh, printing. Um, so the caption here is, they print the news. And again, very interesting because the students printed publications for the government and they sold the publications across the country. Um, they printed a newspaper called the American Indian Report and uh, every issue is online and it's in, in the New York City Public Library. So you can actually go online, make an account and then access those uh, articles. And um, I'm going through that right now. So. If you want to do some research for me, let me know. <laughs> uh, so it was my turn. My turn to go to Phoenix, India. And um, again, uh, it's part adventure, but then you start realizing, gosh, I'm really on my own. And um, like most kids who went there, you know, we come from very poor families, and um, we brought everything we needed in a footlocker, because again, that's military. When you go to boarding school, it's like the first thing you need to do is get a footlocker. So kids came with all, everyone had a footlocker. And in, in your dorm, that became a private storage area that you could lock and keep extra supplies in there. And then you could set it up and ha have a nightstand by your bed or stack them up and have you know shelving or whatever. So however you wanted to use that as furniture in your room. But these are some of my classmates. And um, do you see me? I'm in desperate need of a haircut. <laughs> but, uh, you know, having somebody from home send money was just not common. Nobody had money to send. And so looking for those jobs. So now it's interesting because at the turn of the century, when the students were farming and the, the young girls were being taught, you know, how to cook and clean for other people's homes, um, that actually became a program called the Outing Program. And the Outing Program uh, was a program where pretty much anyone in Phoenix, and it actually went nationwide. We actually found letters in the archives of a woman writing to the school and asking for an Indian boy who could clean rooms and make beds. And they would send them these students to go be domestic laborers in their homes. So, um, 
by the time, in the 1930s, the um, uh, Merriam Report came out, and it was scathing. It said the schools are overcrowded, they're underfunded, the kids are, are, are um, sick, some have died because of disease, because of hunger, uh, and so they were ordered to clean up their act. And um, the Audi program was supposed to have stopped, but it didn't. Because I can tell you, in 1978, I went on the outing program. And that was a chance where you could go and work in someone's home, and they would pay you however much they wanted to pay you. Because honestly, when you're you know, 16, 17 years old, how good are your negotiating skills? You're going to say, I'll work for you for X dollars an hour or whatever. You know, no. At the end of the day, they give you some money and you say thank you. So some people got some you know, decent pay and others didn't. But it was a chance for you to make money on weekends. And again, realize that um, from our knowledge, these people would just call the dorms, because back then there were phone books and everybody had their number in the phone book. And um, they would say, I'm going to come by and I, I need three girls to come work at my house. Or I need you know, a young boy and then they would make the announcement in the dorm, and sometimes there was a sign-up sheet, and you'd go to the office, and they'd say, okay, these people you know, need you to go work. No names, well, maybe a name, but no fingerprints on file, no permission slips, nobody was telling your parents, and um, chances are, like when I got in that car the first time, I didn't know the woman, I didn't know where I was being taken, and I didn't know when I was coming back. But I was, you know, what, 16 years old? And all I knew was that I'm gonna go make some money today. And so I climbed in the stranger's car and off we went. Um, can you imagine that in this day and age? Crazy, isn't it? So the outing program was a part of Phoenix Indian even till the end of the school life. Oh, sorry, that's a close up. I don't wanna scare you. And no judging, okay? But I needed a haircut. So I got involved with the, the school because again, I knew, you know, coming from, coming into Phoenix Indian for the first year and not knowing anyone, a few relatives, but not knowing a whole lot of people, we got involved and we had really great athlete, athletes. So our wrestling team was number one, they took state that year. That's me at, at, at the front there and that's my younger sister, Rosalie, and then the other uh, map mates there. But um, we were outstanding in the athletics. I've met people as I've presented on Phoenix Indian, and I met a woman who said, we used to hate having to play you guys because we always got beat. And that was football, that was, we were great in running. Cross country and track, our, our teams were just outstanding. Uh, football, I'll say this, the um, uh, colors for Phoenix Indian are maroon and gold. And I always say ASU took our colors because back in those days, it was Phoenix Indian, Phoenix Union High School, and, and then what became ASU. It was Arizona Teachers College, I think. And so since those were the only three schools in the whole territory, because Arizona wasn't a state yet, they played each other in football. And there are news reports that say Phoenix Indian beat Arizona Teachers College. So in later years, my uncle tells about how when he went to Phoenix Indian, um, he was on the football team, and ASU would pack up its uniforms when they were done playing with them. You know, maybe they used them for one or two years, and they would bring them over to Phoenix Indian because they were the same school colors. And so they would just change out the name or the numbers or whatever on the jerseys. And he said, but those uniforms were always so big for us because they were, you know, hope we're short. Hope you are, and most tribes out down here in the Southwest are short. The tall ones are from the Plains area. So they actually used hand-me-down uniforms from ASU. And I always laugh about our shirts. You see they're light colored, but you see how the sleeves are, are rolled up and there's a darker color? Those were reversible shirts. So what you're seeing in this black and white photo is the gold side. And then if we had an event for, that was on Saturday and Sunday, we would wear the gold side on the first day and then turn them inside out and wear the maroon side <laughs> on the next day. What do we do? So as, as life is just, you just never know what life is gonna you know, throw at you. So one of the things that happened when I went to Phoenix Indian is when I had a wonderful counselor. 
Her name is Georgiana Davenport, and she was also a Native American. And um, she told me that the Phoenix Gazette, which was, used to be a part of the Arizona Republic, needed a reporter, a correspondent from Phoenix Indian, to report on activities at the school. And it was for a paper called the Teen Gazette that came out on Saturdays as part of the Phoenix Gazette. And, um, and it was a paid position. So I went down for the interview, I got the job, and I started reporting on my school. And it was the most surreal experience because I didn't quite get that, uh, and by the way, these are self-addressed envelopes. Mm -hmm. And you notice, we, I would type up my story, put it in this envelope and mail it. And of course on the side it says, Rush News. <laughs> And today in, in our social media where you can put out a whole news report on your phone, I mean, like this is like back in the dinosaur ages, right? But I'm very proud of that. That's what we used to do. Um, one of the first uh, stories I wrote about was my school and what it was like going to school in a dorm you know, setting, living on campus, and, um, and, uh, and going to school. Because it was very different from other, of course, other high schools in the valley. But what I didn't understand was that my name would be in print, you know, my byline. And the very first story I wrote, uh, the teachers read that paper on Saturday, and Monday they came and they put the, the article on their, on their door, and so everybody could read it. And I saw groups of students, you know, crowding around different doors and they're reading it, and then someone said, you wrote that? And I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh. But then I realized, okay, so that's, part of the game here, right? I write a story, I turn it in, and they're going to give me that byline. So I continued to write about the school, Champion Runners. You know, that we, we were just, it was fun. It was fun telling people about the school. It was fun explaining, you know, you know how great they were and what, what they were doing. And um, so that, oh, sorry. So that started my, um, my career as a journalist. And uh, I have worked in print, I have worked in television and I have worked in radio. And of course now, you know, everything's online. I've done a lot of different things. My, my career has taken me all over. I've met incredible people um, and, and everyday people. And I love what I do. And I'm so grateful that I have the skills that I have, the abilities that I have to do the job that I do because I've always enjoyed my career. It's hectic. It's demanding, but you know what? It's great. And to think that it started at boarding school. You know, and that's what I'm saying. Everyone's, everyone's experience at boarding school is unique to that person. And um, even though I wasn't dragged away by federal agents, um, it, you know, it was a, it, I had no choice but to go to boarding school. And so how do you make the most of it, of whatever situation that you're in? And, um, and then who knows how life comes full circle? And then I end up working at the visitor center and renovating that. So when I was at Phoenix Indian, we had an exchange program to San Diego. And again, keep in mind, this is 1978, 79, all right? Now, some of you probably weren't even born then, but it's really not that long ago. <laughs> and when we got there, we found out that the woman arranging this exchange with the Indians from the Indian school had told our host families that we couldn't speak English, that we'd probably never been to a mall or gone bowling or been to a movie. And so these were suggested activities for us. And so it was really comical to come into my host family and they're looking at me like, well, you speak English just fine. And then to find out that that was the perception of this woman in San Diego in 1978. So there are those of us who went on the exchange program at the end of the year, I ended up getting the Spirit Award, which I have donated to the Visitor Center Gallery. So you can go in there and see that. And um, this was all made by my classmates who, who took wood shop, right? So they carved out the P, which I say stands, stands for Patty, but you know, it's really Phoenix Indian, and the nice plaque. And I didn't even knew, I don't remember saving this, but apparently I'm a pack rat. And uh, <laughs> I was able to find it in the whole process of renovating the building. and so. I was able to donate that to the visitor center. And I've donated all of my articles there too, so they can keep that and, and continue to display them. 
We're coming up to times of questions. I hope you guys start having questions. This is the gallery inside the visitor center. And again, you've got uh, various displays there. You can learn more about Phoenix Indian and, um, and see more stories about you know, all the different students who went to school there. And, um, and then if you have somebody who went to Phoenix Indian, they actually have a form you can fill out and you can send away to the National Archives for your relative's uh, file and learn more. And there's amazing information. Some files are really big and has great information. I have a friend whose mother went to Phoenix Indian and when she got her mother's file, she found out how active her mother was in all these different clubs and activities and then buried in there and said her mother graduated summa cum laude from Phoenix Indian. And she said, my mom never talked about that. Never said anything. And she didn't say, she didn't tell me she was the president of the dorm and, you know, so she got a whole, another look at her mother as a teenager. So that was very enlightening for her and a lot of fun. So you never know what's in the record. Um, more trophies. I have to brag about PI, right? By the time the school closed, and the school closed because the Hopi tribe and the Tona Altam tribe both had decided enough is enough. We need to build high schools and junior highs on our reservation lands so we don't have to send our kids out anymore. So they put, you know, building a school is like a 10 year or more process. So the projections were these schools are going to open up, the enrollment at Phoenix Indian is going to go down. It's not, an, you know, the student population is not enough to justify keeping that school open. So it was under President Reagan, they made the decision to close Phoenix Indian in 1990. And by then, and this is kind of crazy, but you think about the history of the boarding school and now in those very first, you know, probably the first decade, maybe two decades, where parents resisted and fought so hard to keep their kids at home, it became normal after a while because parents who fought to keep their kids home were punished. Whole tribes were punished. Maybe rations were set aside. Um, 19 Hopi men were sent to Alcatraz and put in prison there for almost a year because they fought the agents and tried to keep them from taking their kids. That was their crime. So those early years of being punished gave way to resignation, to normalcy. It's normal to have our kids get sent off to boarding school. So by the time I went to school there, my family had had a long history of us going to Phoenix Indian. Not Sherman, which is in California. We always like, oh, Sherman, you know. We have rivalries. You know, not Stewart Indian School in Nevada, not Intermountain in Utah, or any one of the other schools across the country. You know, we were the family who went to Phoenix Indian, PI. That's how you know you're in the know when you say, you would call it PI. Because all the other kids, you know, from other schools, where did you go? I went to Sherman. Oh, where'd you go? Stewart. You know, one word. When it comes to Phoenix Indian, we say PI, and they know what we're talking about. So we don't call it PIS, okay? So it became normal to send the kids off to boarding school. And by the end, when the school closed in 1990, there was an outcry. Keep it open for one more year, and then it'll be an even 100 years. And then the juniors said, and then I can say I graduated from Phoenix Indian. They wanted that. But the government said, nope, you know, economics, we're closing it down this year. So it closed after 99 years of operation. So, is that what it, yeah, okay. So as I um, mentioned earlier, I am writing a book. I'm writing a book with my co-author, Heather Cabot, and um, we are looking at my family's history at Phoenix Indian, and we're looking at key characters, people from the government side who put in, who helped uh, run these policies. The policies that were in place, they implemented them. And um, we're looking very specifically at the outing program and how many of our people were trained because it's important to remember that they did not, they had been in the government and the agents, the people who ran the schools, did not encourage us and train us and educate us to go to college. That was not an option. It was have a trade and have a job. How many of our brilliant minds went to waste because they were told, here's, here's a trade for you to learn, not here's a college for you to 
go to. And I find it very interesting because what was happening with Native Americans, you know, we were told, you must be a part of us, you must speak English, you must go to school. What was happening to African Americans? They were told, you can't be a part of us, you can't be in our schools, you can't ride our buses, you can't integrate. And what did they do? By the 1800s, they were establishing their own historically black colleges and universities. They were being educated. They were educating themselves. And I ask people this all the time. Name me five Native American leaders. And don't be coming at me with Geronimo and Sitting Bull and, you know, five Native American leaders today who are alive and working. Can you guys? Deb Holland? That's one. Anybody else? Now name me five African American leaders. Yeah, five who are alive. How about the Vice President of the United States of America? <laughs> Kamala Harris, okay. And did you know the first person of color who was the Vice President of the United States was Ka Indian, Charles Curtis. So, you know, again, what happened to our, our, our people in this whole process? And um, so we're looking at that. We're looking at this bigger picture when it comes to boarding school. So I have a shameless plug. I'm not embarrassed. Pull out your phones, get out your Instagram accounts, and follow us, please. That's a, that's a nice request. Um, at Indian School Road, and you can see all of our posts that we have so far. Our book will come out in 2026. And um, we are looking at, um, again, my family's experience at Phoenix Indian, and then the outing program, and how that program shaped the, um, the building of various cities. OK? Thank you so much. So through this all, some of our research, we have found actual letters and um, records about, at Phoenix Indian in particular, and um, the agents, you know, and, and the school administration saying that when the, all the Indian kids were brought to Phoenix Indian, they said the ones that were hardest to convert, the ones who were hardest to, to you know, tell them, you know, forget your language and your religion and all that, um, were the Hopi, the Hopi kids, because we came with such strong values. And it all starts in our cornfield. And people call us dry uh, farmers. And um, you know we're, we're in a high desert. We get less than, I don't know, seven inches of rain a year. And the only way our, our crops are watered is by our prayers and by our good way of living. So we pray and, and we ask for that rain to nourish our field so that our, our corn will grow. We, corn is our main food. We also pray with corn. All of our ceremonies revolve around corn. So I don't say we're farmers. You know, People say you're faith-based farmers. But when you put the word farm on there, you take away the religious aspect of it. So we continue to hold on to this day. So this was taken just a few months ago in my uncle's field. And uh, you know, we, we, everybody goes to help plant. They go to help you know, take care of the field, you know, weed it, and then also help harvest. And then there's a whole process. I mean, gosh, that's just the corn. And then you look at the melons, you look at the, the beans, you look at the squash, everything else that has to be uh, harvested and then prepared for storage. We still do that. So no matter what the government did to us, including telling us we can't speak our language, we continue to speak and we continue to practice our way of life and continue to practice our religion. So I brought Heather out. I said it's important that you come to the cornfield and you help out there and you understand and you see what Hopi is all about. So she's been a great sport. I even got her to go brand some cattle. Um, <clears throat> at the start of this year, I was very, uh, very honored to be the person to give Secretary Holland a tour of the Phoenix Indian School. She wanted to know, you know, what are the stories from the school? And how, you know, how did that impact us? And I told her as well, you know, everyone's story is, is unique. Because they, they, I can't speak for all of the students. I can speak from my uh, uh, own experience, but everyone has their own story. 
So she took that, and then she, the next day they held um, public hearings, and she listened to other people talk about their experience, not just at Phoenix Indian, but at all boarding schools. So it is a complicated history, and um, the, the Heard Museum has a wonderful exhibit on boarding school. If you can't physically get to the boarding school uh, or to the Heard Museum, hey, you know what, they have an app. <laughs> And you can download the Herd app, and you can take the tour on your phone. And I actually um, give that tour. So I narrated that. So you, if you're not tired of hearing from me today, you can take the tour on, on, uh, on your phone. Um, so again, you know, who would have thought? I'm, I'm, you know, this boarding school kid. I'm now embracing that title of boarding school survivor because I'm starting to really understand and realize that I am surviving like all of my family before me survived. And who, who would think that, you know, Patty Tong Hungva ends up, you probably can't see it because that's kind of small, in the USA Today crossword puzzle. And I found out, I'm five across. Can you see that? <laughs> well, I did find out how many of my friends do crossword puzzles and USA Today in particular, because my phone started ringing like crazy and telling me, you're the clue. <laughs> and it cracked me up. So I think, you know, again, you never know where your life is going to take you and what is going to happen, but how do you approach it and how do you roll with it, as the saying goes. So I encourage each one of you, you know, I really appreciate you, those of you who came here today, those of you who are listening online, you know, you're here to learn something new, a, a different perspective perhaps, and, and, and that's what's wonderful, right? You're in charge of your own choices. So how do you choose to educate yourself? You know, whether it's coming here, whether it's going to the Heard Museum, whether it's, whether it's looking up stories um, from the past, but how do you educate yourself? How do you embrace your, um, you're in charge of your learning, you know, beyond uh, your community college experience? So I encourage all of you, and then, you know, now you have some knowledge, go share it with somebody else. Tell them what you've heard, what you've learned, and uh, there's no end to educating, and certainly no end to having people understand the boarding school history, because I didn't even talk about how it affected us in our food, but, and are, are we on, we're almost, we're, well, we're way over time, um, but the food aspect, you know, before Europeans arrived, we didn't have cows, we didn't have dairy, we didn't have wheat, we didn't have refined sugars, and yet that's a part of our everyday diet. And then you look at the health disparities of Native Americans, no wonder. So, a lot with boarding school. But do we have time for some questions? Because I know they all have questions. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So I'm a past president of the Native American Journalist Association, and we took a stand on that as well and, and said, yes, you know, we are not mascots. And, um, and that, again, you look at the history of how pretty much white America has portrayed us, has looked at us, and has dealt with us, that it's okay to continue to characterize us. But it's not. It's not. And you don't, like, you know, we just had Halloween. And every year, it's like you're bracing. And when my son was a little boy, I was like, oh, you know, here we go again. You know, someone's going to come around dressed as an Indian. And yet, you know, how can I raise my son to be proud of his heritage, his culture, when you've got people parading around in, in whatever they think is an Indian? So, um, yes, and that extends to, to athletics. So people keep saying you're honoring us. But how does that honor us? I mean, really, how does that honor um, a whole race of people? And you're right. 
it's interesting that we're the only race that has to continue to deal with that. And I know that the Washington team is, you know, talking about bringing back their mascot. And it's like, wow, in this day and age, you still want to do something like that? But, uh, but I think that, especially the younger generation with social media, there's a lot of pressure. You know, don't do that. And understanding, again, you know, history is recorded, you know, they say by the victor, right? Um, <clears throat> and that might be true to a point, but once you learn something, is it okay to stay ignorant about something? Is it okay? I would say no. Once you're enlightened and you learn, then what's the next step? Does that answer? Good. National Congress of American Indians. Yes, go ahead. Let's call him. <laughs> no, you know, it's so funny because um, uh, his father is non-native, and uh, so he's biracial. And when he was in kindergarten, the teacher, our first parent-teacher conference, she was like, I want to talk to you about this photo that, that or, or I mean, not this picture that your son drew. And, um, you know, when I got married, I, I was very, I mean, in our vows, we said we're going to raise our son in our my Hopi culture. And he was 100% for that, you know, Nick's father. So he went along. And um, part of that is, in Hopi, in our culture, when you have sisters, your sister's kids are your kids too. And they grow up calling all of us mom. So when he went to kindergarten, the first thing they say is draw your family. So there's my poor kid, he's like drawing all these people, right? <laughs> and, um, and he gives the teacher his picture and she's like, your mom has all these kids because he just drew his brothers and sisters. And then he drew me and he drew his dad. And I had to explain, oh, and then he, he put his name. He didn't write his dad's name. He wrote my last name. And so, because he really identified with being Hopi. And in our culture, if your mother is Hopi, then you're Hopi because our clan is passed through, by, uh, through the women. And so he's always been raised as that, with that strong Hopi identity. He's very much involved with the culture. And, um, and so, you know, he, he has this perspective of himself, and he sees me going out. He's been with me to a lot of events. And, you know, like any kid, you know, like, oh, okay, mom, so you're gonna go talk. Oh, okay, great, good. You know, I mean, he just accepts it, right? Uh, but I will check in with him now and say, now what do you think? <laughs> But he was he was laughing when I came out of the crossword puzzle. He says that's cool. So, but yes, he's um, he's very much aware, and uh, certainly with the book process, he's becoming more aware. And I think for him and the other kids in the family, they're you know they never thought to ask what is what was our great 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 grandmother's name, in Hopi. And now we have a whole line. I've created a whole family tree, with all their Hopi names first because that's how we need to identify. Then they acquired an English name and it was this. So it's important, that connection is important. So yeah, I'll tell him that he got a question today. Thank you. Okay, yes. loaded you know it's it's because um identity right 
and, and we're, again, we're the only race of people who are asked your quantum, like, how much Indian are you? Like, well, oh. I mean, I am full-blooded, but, but my son, like I was just saying, you know, he, he's biracial, but he identifies very strongly as Hopi. So um, DNA tests are very limited because they, they only show that you have these markers that indicate you have some native ancestry. But beyond that, there's no way to tell which tribe you came from. So uh, my best effort is to say what, like which ancestors, and you have to have first and last names, maiden names, but go to the census. Go to the census, where did your family come from? You can start there. So if they were, well, what's going on here? If they were, um, let's say they were in Phoenix, Arizona, okay, in, in 1900. Well, you can go, you, you have to go to the main branch of the Phoenix Public Library. I don't know if Glendale has this, but I, I have done research at the Burton Bar Library, and um, you have to go up to the sixth floor or whatever, and, and um, uh, of course, you need your library card, but uh, get on their library system, and they have an in-house connection to the U.S. Census Bureau. Now, here's the crazy part. U.S. Census allowed Ancestry.com to digitize all of the records. So if you just did this at home, you would have to create an Ancestry.com account, which you have to pay for, and then you're filling in information for them, and if your family wants to access that, then they have to pay for it. Don't do that. I'm, I was so adamant, like, no, this is free information. The census is government information. I should be able to get it free of charge without paying this company for my family's information and then building their, their database for them. So on principle, I was like, nope, I'm not doing that. So I went to the library, looked up the information. I had first and last names. I had location of where they were born, and I started doing research, and I pulled up all kinds of documents. They even have a page where it will list their neighbors. So who knows from that, you know, you can trace back where, where did your family live, um, and some of them, you know, do have, well, for, for Hopi, they did say they were Hopi. So that's a deep dive, but it's, it's a chance you know, that you can go back and find who, where did my family come from, and then, and who, how did they identify back in the 1900s? Now, I also know that back in that time frame, being an Indian was the worst thing you could be. <laughs> so sometimes people did not want to identify as being Native. And so if you come across something like that, there, I mean, if there's no information, there's no information. But, at least it's a start, and if and, and there's no guarantee too that just because your family came from an area that had a ni high native population, that you would have an, a way to identify which tribe. So it is tough, and this is the kind of identity issues that, again, people from boarding school are dealing with too. Um, I was t talking to your president before we had this presentation, and I was telling her that there are um, grandchildren of kids who went to boarding school, and they're angry because their grandparents met at boarding school. They're from two different tribes, so they're full-blooded Indian. Their parents are, you know, were full-blooded, but from different tribes, and um, the grandparents didn't know which tribe or culture or language to raise the kids with. So they chose just to not raise them with any connection to either culture. And so now those grandkids are coming back and saying, who am I? I'm an Indian, but what does that mean? I don't know anything about either tribe. So we have people in that situation too, which is again, because of government policy. I hope that's not too tough. I've had talks with my sister about this, because we never usually would know exactly what everything is I just felt it, it was interesting for me being a young black man for a Native American to come up and ask me, you look Native, who should try? And I was like, I <laughs> don't know, I'm black. And they're like, you have high cheekbones for a black man. And I was like, I 
yes, I want to win. You know, I, I took it as a compliment because I love Native Americans. You know, I have my one of my best friends is Native American. We make music together, mm -hmm. and he was telling me all about the different tribes and different um, aspects of how natives and blacks were kind of correlated together in terms of like. Yeah, the there's objects. a big history. There's a, a really big history between Native Americans and, and uh, Black Americans, and you know that involves taking in slaves, runaway slaves. Um, some of them were adopted into tribes. Some of them married into tribes. So yes, I have had a lot of people come up and say, you know, we know we're Native American in our family. We just don't know which tribe. So, and that happened in, with my journalist group, right? So they they were a part of the National Association of Black Journalists. And I would tell them, well, then you're in the wrong association. You need to join Naja. <laughs> but yes, any other questions? We're all good? Well, thank you. I really appreciate presenting today, you know, and um, uh, in my, my village, in our language, we have three dialects. And um, it's also interesting because some of the words have gender. So the women at my village only, at my mesa, say esquali, and that means thank you. The women at the other two mesas and all the villages over there, they say asquali. And the men say all across it, all three mesas, they say kwa kwa for thank you. So you get a little bit of a Hopi lesson here today. So I just want to say esquali, I really appreciate all of you listening today, listening to my presentation, and, um, and go educate yourself. Esquali.